TikTok, time to rock. That's right. Good That's evening, right. good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all around the world. I am your friendly neighborhood philosopher, D. Wood. And with me is <laughs> the Assyrian Sneezer. That's right. <laughs> Did you got that corona, Sam? God forbid, I hope not. In Jesus' name, I pray the Lord Jesus protects us from COVID-19 because I don't have health insurance, so I trust Jesus, Yahovah Rapha, to be my health insurance and protect us for his glory. So, hey, that's where it is. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we intended to talk about how Muslims deify Muhammad on yesterday's live stream. But, as is so frequently the case, anytime we talk about any topic, Muslims insist, they absolutely demand that we start wrecking their profit. They just can't yeah. stop. They can't, they can't stay away. They, they have this, this need for us to wreck their profit. So no matter what, no matter what topic we bring up, we could, we could say, guys, we're going to talk about the Trinity and we invite all Muslims to raise their objections to the Trinity. Or we can say, we're going to talk about the Bible and we invite all Muslims to raise their objections against the Bible. doesn't matter what topic we bring up. As soon as we bring it up, Muslims start insisting, no. We want to talk about Muhammad beating women and having sex with prepubescent girls. We demand that you instead talk about that. And guys, we're laid back. We aim to please. So if you guys want to talk about that anytime. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, now, Sam, yep. now, Sam, we are here to talk about a very important topic. Sam, why is it, why is it important yes. yep. for us to expose how you, you basically got two things. One, you've got how the religion of Islam actually deifies Muhammad and mm. indisputably makes him some kind of partner with Allah. You've got that. But then you've got Muslim apologists who deify Muhammad because they know that their listeners, their followers are ignorant and aren't paying attention. And so we see what they're doing. We see how the apologists are actually calling Muhammad God. And we're actually going to look at some examples of Muslim apologists doing this. <clears throat> yes. um, but you have Muslim apologists who are Openly calling, openly calling Muhammad God, and yes. their followers don't know what they're doing, and so they just get a free pass. But why is this important to actually yep. show Muslim? One second, Amia, <coughs> Emily says, "David, I love your background. This is this is not a background. This is to block out the sun. Anytime I'm recording anything and it's during the daytime, that's a that's a big window behind me." And especially in the afternoon, the sun comes right through that window. So I hang a big black yeah. backdrop over it to, to block the sun. Otherwise, uh, I can't record, can't do anything. So, all right, Sam, why is that important? Well, uh, even before I say that, let's ask the Lord Jesus to bless us. We in beseech and invoke the Father of our Lord Jesus to bless the session, to bless you and I. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. Guide us by the Spirit to speak truth without error to save us from stammering, confusion, misspeaking, to speak the truth for the glory of Jesus to the best of our ability so that Muslims will see the truth, be convicted by the Spirit, to leave Muhammad and fall in love with Jesus. Bless this session, Father. Lord Jesus, blessed, Holy Spirit, blessed, and seal us for the glory of Jesus. In Jesus' name, we need you, and we trust you, and we depend on you. Amen, amen. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Yeah, well, it's very important because, as you stated, <clears throat> off the bat, Muslims keep going around boasting, number one, that Islam teaches the purest form of monotheism called Tawheed. Now, <clears throat> just from the Quran alone, and I've done sessions on this, you've done sessions on this, and again, I'm going to sound like a broken record. I even have articles on my blog on answeringislam.net <clears throat> where we demonstrate from the Quran, as well as the Hadiths, that though the Quran does say Muhammad is an imperfect, fallible, wicked, transgressor whose deity repeatedly threatens to kill if he doesn't get his act together by the same token at the same time the Quran attributes certain qualities <clears throat> roles and functions to Muhammad that clearly elevate him to divine status and makes him a partner with the Muslim deity that's inarguable and I challenge any Muslim debate me on this we've have a, we've <clears throat> issued a challenge I've issued a challenge at non even his uh, co, C-O, period, whether Hamza Mayed or Ijaz Ahmed, debate me on these topics. Let's see if they'll take the challenge. But here's what's fascinating. One, 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 one second, Sam, on that note, because 
It's just strange that in pretty much every live stream, we invite Muslims to come on, join us yep. here. Um, I know we wreck Muhammad, but we're, <clears throat> we're, we're generally pretty pretty polite when we're having uh, discussions. And if they want to have one-on-one -on -one discussion or debate, two-on-two, -two, we're, we're fine with any of those. So we invite, they, they don't have to, they don't have to. I'm, I'm not going to run around thumping my chest. Oh, everyone's scared of me. Oh, everyone's running, right? That, that's, what, yeah. that's what they do. But I will point out, guys, we're the ones that keep inviting them. Right. Um, if they do not come on, that is on them. It's very easy. You send me a message, say, David, uh, heard. We know they watch these because they keep responding to them. Right. Yep. So we know they watch them, but they keep con I mean, they, they, they keep responding, but it's very easy. Send an email, say, say guys, uh, heard your offer to come on with you and I'd like to come on. Um, and then all it would be was discussing the rules in order to keep it from, from becoming, you know, uh, yes, people talking over and stuff. And so the rules would be like, okay, you know, here are the time limits. You get five minutes and he gets five minutes and, you know, then two minutes back and forth or something like that. Become coming up with some, some structure so that it's not a big mess. But guys, right. we're the ones who are constantly inviting, uh, all of your favorite Muslim apologists to come on here. They don't Now You should be wondering why they don't want to. You should be wondering that. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. Sam. Oh, hang yeah. on. Let, 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 let me respond to Rory uh, Rory Husky here, who uh, keeps uh, um, uh, asking me about yesterday. He said, uh, David Wood, will you get back to my super chat from yesterday? Uh, and has that guy replied to you yet? Uh, Rory Husky, I saw you posting that you were, uh, you were making videos and so on. Um, I'm kind of swamped, but make no mistake. Make no mistake. I'm going to check out. I'm going to check out your. Uh, I'm going to check out your stuff. And everyone there, you can see yeah. Rory Husky. Um, if you want to go check yeah. out ahead of time. Uh, yeah, I, I, know, I, know, right, I know what he's referring to when he talks about Sir Chapter 15, verse 9. That's one of the passages I use to show the incorruptibility mm -hmm. of the Holy Bible. But that's another topic. Mm -hmm. And again, just for the record, here's my challenge to Adnan Rashid so that people can go back and tell him. And I'm willing to debate Hamza Mayat, that convert to Islam, who thinks he knows his stuff. Even Ajaz Ahmed, who's not worth debating. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Does the Quran teach Tawheed? That's the first topic. It doesn't have to be in any particular order, but does the Quran teach Tawheed? And shouldn't 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 every Muslim be on the planet the jump for joy yeah. at the chance to school the mighty yeah. Sam Shimon on, on, on Tawheed? That topic, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, so secondly, Muhammad's view of the Bible, corrupt or incorruptible. Muhammad's view of the Bible. And thirdly, we can debate whether the Bible teaches the Trinity or the deity of Christ. That's their choice. But here is my standing challenge. I want to debate these these three topics and don't let them use the excuse that I'm mean and I'm rude because as David and others can testify, go watch the professional moderated debates. I'm on my best behavior when it's a professional debate with equal time. I don't get personal. I don't get nasty. I meet the person where he's at and by the power of the Lord Jesus decimate the argument. So don't and, use that as an excuse. It and, doesn't work. And and apart from that, how would that even be an excuse when their debaters are some of the most insulting, condescending yeah. people on the planet? You could sit there calmly responding to their questions. They're constantly heaping abuse on their opponents. And Muslims love it then. Muslims, right. Muslims, have you noticed they always love it when it's their guy insulting other people? As soon as you insult in return, then it's then you're treating less like then then you're you're acting like people are are equal and have equal rights and they can't get their minds around that right that it, in the in the Islamic mind it's no we get to abuse you we get to treat you like garbage the second you respond in kind then we lose our minds because that's not the way things are supposed to be hundred percent because we're yeah. enemies and here's my my challenge you had none. I want you to come out publicly condemn Muhammad Hijab because your excuse was <clears throat> that you respect and honor Muhammad more than your mother's. And because we dishonor Muhammad by calling him what he is, you won't debate us. Will you then condemn Muhammad Hijab for the abuse that he hurled on David Wood? Not that David Wood is complaining because glory to Jesus Christ. And I'm not just saying it because I'm here with him. Pay attention to the content. Muhammad Hijab humiliated and embarrassed himself because the things he said were humiliating that if I was a fellow Muslim apologist, I would have to rebuke him and disassociate myself from him because he was an embarrassment. But Adnan, if you're really all about being polite and kind, we want you to come out and publicly condemn Muhammad Hijab saying he disgraced us in his nasty vitriol and added towards David Wood because this is something Muhammad wouldn't do. But we know he won't do that. Now, the other reason why there's a problem with what they're doing the passages that they quote that supposedly prophesy Muhammad, first and foremost, 
they're being inconsistent, David, and you know this. So we're going to say this to the Christians here so they can learn. They first want to tell us that the Torah is not the five books of the Old Testament called the Pentateuch. The Torah is the original revelation given to Moses, bits of which can be found in the Pentateuch. And yet the Quran, and again, correct me, David, if I'm wrong, the Quran says that you'll find prophecies of this unlettered prophet in the Torah and the gospel that's with them. But last time I checked, according to them, the Torah is not the five books of Moses, let alone any of the books in the Old Testament. So then why, David, are they quoting books such as Isaiah or Habakkuk if they're telling us the Torah isn't the five books of the Old Testament, let alone any of the books of the Old Testament. Can you help me understand that logic here? Because I'm a little confused here. Oh, you're not the one who's confused. They're the ones who are confused, Sam. Uh, it's it's the same methodology always, right? Uh, we can go to any book in the Bible and show that it's actually condemning Islam. And they'll say, oh, you can't use that. We don't believe in that book. Nope, that's been corrupted. But they will go to absolutely any book and use it for confirmation of, of Muhammad. I mean, they'll go to Song of Solomon, right? These same, the same Muslims who come to us and say, you see, your Bible's an evil book. Song of Solomon is about this sexual relationship between a husband and a wife. It's so perverted, it's like pornography. The same Muslim will turn around and go to other Christians and say, Muhammad is prophesied right there in, in Song of Solomon, right? So they will, it, it, it it's, it's, I've never seen anyone pick and choose to this extent. I've never seen yeah. any human being with a God-given mind That's right. cherry pick whatever uh. will support their religion while while completely contradicting themselves every time they speak, right? And 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 it's and here here's here's the here's the amazing part, Sam, putting what you just said together. They'll they'll, they'll say that the Bible's corrupted. Then yep. they'll go to parts of the Bible to confirm their prophet. They'll say, nope, we only believe in the part that's given to Moses and the part that's given to Jesus. Then they'll go to Isaiah and Song of Solomon and Habakkuk, yep. right? And they'll say, these, exactly. are, these, these are these true yeah. parts of the Bible. And then when they do it, they'll go to parts that are actually about God. They'll take out God and say it's about Muhammad. And this is insane. This is, an in, I mean, anyone who did this, I mean, could, you Muslims who are watching, imagine this. Imagine I want to say I'm the next prophet after, after Muhammad. And then... And I say, I was confirmed by Muhammad in the perfect word of God, the Quran. And then you say, no, 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 the Quran says that Muhammad's the seal of the prophets and blah, blah, blah. I say, no, those parts have been corrupted. You can't trust those parts. And you'd start, I think you'd start being suspicious. Then what if I went to the Quran and I started going to verses that are clearly about Allah and saying that they're about me. They're confirming uh -huh. that I'm a prophet. All these verses that are about <laughs> Allah, they're actually talking about me. Would you not be thinking to yourself, you stupid, stupid pagan deceiver, how dare you treat our book like this? How dare you uh -huh. act in that way? And imagine I went around telling all kinds of followers, yes, I am prophesied right here in all these verses that are clearly talking about Allah. It's actually talking about me. And any part that disagrees, that's been corrupted. Would you not think this is the stupidest, most deceptive, evil, exactly. wicked, demon-possessed person on the planet? Great. That's what your prophet and that's what your greatest apologists do with our book. Oh, it's been corrupted, except all these parts that, we, that are actually about God and we're going to say they're about Muhammad. You, what sort of pagan nonsense is this? What kind of religion needs this nonsense to prop it up? Only Islam. All right, go ahead, Seth. Yep. No, that's it. You basically made the point. They're now going to quote passages that are not the Torah, which means that if they're consistent, they're going to have to argue that the Torah does include the Old Testament. Understand the dilemma, folks. Understand what David just said. Uh, and, and the reason why we repeat this more than once is because we know we need to hear things repetitively until it becomes second nature. And David will amen this. We want every one of you to learn these arguments. These are battle-tested, battle-refined arguments, spiritual battle, because we're called to spiritual battle, not killing people with guns and knives and so on. Spiritually <clears throat> battle-tested, refined arguments to be used by the power of the Holy Spirit to glorify Jesus and destroy Islam and expose Muhammad. Now, if they're going to quote Isaiah, Habakkuk, that means now they are indirectly affirming Torah can be used in reference to the entire Old Testament, which is exactly what we've been saying in previous sessions. When you say gospel, gospel to a Christian at the time of Muhammad, you would either mean the fourfold gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or the entire New Testament, 
because from the Christian perspective, the entire New Testament is the gospel that Jesus revealed by his spirit through his inspired emissaries and scripturated and preserved. Now, same thing with Torah, because the word Torah is the Hebrew word for instruction. Even in the New Testament, and David knows this, so I'm not saying this to David, I'm, I'm hoping that if someone doesn't know this, they'll now discover the fact that even the word Torah and the Greek equivalent for Torah is nomos, nomos. That is used not just for the five books of Moses. It's used for the Old Testament corpus. How do I know? Let me give you just one example for the sake of time. In the Gospel of John, John chapter 10, you read verses 34 to 35. Our Lord Jesus says to the Jews, is it not written in your law? Hebrew, that would have been Torah. Is it not written in your Torah? I say you are gods. Now, here's what's interesting. He cites Psalm 82, verse 6. Christians, get this point. Psalm 82, verse 6, and he calls it your law, the Torah. So even the New Testament confirms the term Torah and its Greek equivalent, nomos, had a broader application. It didn't just mean the revelations given through Moses called the Pentateuch. It could also mean the entire Old Testament. Anytime a Muslim goes to something other than the five books of the Old Testament, points to Isaiah, they too are conceding that the Torah can mean the entire Old Testament canon, which means the gig is up, the charade is up, they've been busted, Islam is exposed, Muhammad is put in his place as a false prophet. So there you go. All right. Um, quick comment here. Just a quick correction, because it uh, seems no one ever understands anything. Uh, <laughs> really? You're shocked yeah. about that? Yeah, sir. Uh, yeah, sir says, J. Smith, a Christian missionary, even said that the Old Testament has more violence than the Quran. In the Old Testament, they treat women like garbage, and you guys say the Quran is evil? Yeah, sir, do you even understand what J. Smith is talking about? Exactly. The Quran is covering a period of 23 years, right? The, the Quran. It's the 20, it, it, it's the, these are the revelations Muhammad receives over a period of 23 years. And it's, uh, you got, you know, his first 12 years or so, but then uh, his last 10 years, about his last 10 years, it's nonstop fighting and bloodshed. The Old Testament is covering a period of more than a thousand years written on three different continents. Do you, do, you under, do you understand why that would contain more violence? I mean, notice, you could say, oh, my history my history of World War II book. My history of World War II book contains more violence than the Quran. Of, yeah, of, of course it does. You're covering World War II. Millions and millions or tens of millions of people died. Uh, it's covering a massive world war. Um, you've got Muhammad, this guy who's going around in Arabia. He starts fighting everyone. The Bible's covering, the, the Old Testament is covering... Well, I mean, if you talk about the history, it actually covers talking about thousands and thousands of years. But the actual the the people who are writing it, you're talking about a long time, a lot of battles, Egypt, all these different places, all these different contexts, and so on. And so, if you're talking about just quantity, of course, we're not talking about the quantity of violence. Again, any World War II book is going to have more violence in it than uh, than the Quran. We're talking about the final marching orders and the impact it's had on the world, right? Um, <clears throat> if you read the Bible from beginning to end, would you ever think that I'm supposed to walk around and kill people? No, you never get that idea. Exactly. You think I'm supposed to live in peace with everyone, uh, to harm no one, to do good to everyone, to treat others as I would want to be treated. Those are the final marching orders of the Bible. You look at the final marching orders of the Quran, the final marching orders of the Quran are to violently subjugate the entire world anytime you're able. And when you're not able, then you pretend to be peaceful. Those are the final marching orders of the Quran. If you don't see the difference yeah. there, if you don't see the difference yeah. there, then I don't know what books you're reading. So hopefully that clears things up because, Sam, I've just noticed they noticed. I, I pointed that and out. We're not going to let you guys do it. Go ahead. Yeah. I know what you're going to say. Yeah. No, no I, the, the, what I wanted to point out there, what I wanted to bring up there is there is always a twisting of the words, right? That is another example, right? Jay Smith said, Jay Smith is talking about the quantity of violence because you're covering a much larger period, right? You're covering not just not just the, the time of one prophet. You're covering many, many prophets over a long, long period of time in doing things on different continents, right? Um, yeah. The Muslim will take that. You see, even Jay Smith ad admits that the Bible is far more violent than the Quran. Um, but that's the exact same thing they'll do with uh, with verses of, of the Bible that they twist into talking about Muhammad. It's we've pointed this at every live stream. We point out, ladies and gentlemen, 
which Muslims are here defending Islam that speak truthfully and accurately and don't twist anything? Who, who's doing it? Who's, who's carefully going through the evidence and refuting what we're saying? I don't find any. The only, the only ones here, the only Muslims here who seem to be honest are the ones who say, well, they're actually questioning it and they're listening and paying attention and trying to, trying to process what we're saying. The ones who are actually defending Islam, they can't, they can't stop making things up and lying. It's interesting stuff. Interesting religion yeah. that produces this. I just want to share some with one, some guy said energy. He goes, stop, David, you're making sense. And then uh, another guy said, Jack Leslie, Sam once brought a knife to a gunfight just to even out the odds. Sounds like a Chuck Norris saying. Just want you to know that. Yeah. Just um, want you to know that. So stop, David, you're making sense. That's what energy. Stop it. All you're right. making sense. You're scaring me. Now, look at this. <laughs> I don't fall for it, David. Don't <laughs> let them suck you into the comments, David. Every don't time I try to get out, they keep pulling they, me yeah, back yeah, in. Yeah, 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 man. They keep don't pulling let them me back it. in. These, these evil, evil agents of the double trying to sex you. But what is it? What do they when say they make time? it easy, when they make it easy like this, Riddle Factory, while you are busy yeah, yeah. mocking God and his messenger in your vlogs, we Muslims are respecting Jesus more than we respect <laughs> our parents as a prophet of God. Difference between you and us. Right. Notice, Sam, these these same Muslims, these same Muslims will who claim to respect the prophets and so on, will go around trying to accuse everyone of pedophilia and violence in the Bible. Right? right. These same Muslims will say we respect Jesus, but they'll try to take a, a quote from Jesus where he's delivering a parable and a ruler in the parable says, as for those enemies who didn't want me ruling over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. These same Muslims will take that verse, completely rip it out of context completely rip it out of the story that Jesus is saying and say, you see, this is Jesus telling Christians to go around killing and slaughtering these same people who claim to yeah. be, uh, to be, uh, to, to, to respect the prophets of the Bible and so on. These same people, oh, I get worse. These same <clears throat> people will say that Abraham sent his servant to get a three-year-old daughter for his son, Isaac, Isaac the, exactly. the complete total lie, right? These same people will say, yes, Joseph was 90 or 99 and, and Mary was only this little 10 year old or 11 year old or 12 year old, complete deceptive nonsense. And in addition to all that, they're talking about the Lord of creation, the second person of the eternal Trinity. And they treat him like a prophet of Islam, which is the most, ins I can't think of a more insulting thing that you could possibly okay. say than, Yes, this guy basically taught the same thing as our disgusting prophet Muhammad. All right, yeah. that is the most insulting thing you could ever say about someone. You guys, and then you you twist all you twist the entire Bible into a bunch of pedophilia and violence and prophecies about Muhammad, and you claim to be respecting Jesus. Do you have any idea how demonic and stupid and evil this is? Riddle Factory. So riddle me that. Uh, yeah, and, but <laughs> but to add to that. Uh -huh. Uh, Riddle Factory <clears throat> either is ignorant or deceitful because I've heard people like Ahmadidat, not just these wicked <clears throat> internet jihadis who do a hit and run, where they will accuse the Bible of <clears throat> perverted language in describing Mary's conception. Don't take my word for it. Go listen to Ahmadidat. He makes a mockery of Luke 135 where it says the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And he describes it in such a nasty, vulgar, wicked, <clears throat> satanic manner because he perfectly <clears throat> embodied what Titus 1.15 says. To the pure, all things are pure. To the corrupt <clears throat> and unbelieving, nothing is pure because their very minds and consciences are corrupt. And <clears throat> let alone hearing Muslims talk about your God came out of a woman's canal, but they get even more gra graphic. Or that your, your God you know, <clears throat> needed diapers or he pooed on himself or he urinated on himself. And that's respecting Jesus. Yeah, right. Let alone other stuff that even people like Didat have said. So you're lying. You do not respect the real Jesus of history, who's the Christ of the New Testament. What you respect is this satanic counterfeit called Isa, who's not the real Jesus of history, who's the Christ of the New Testament. So stop your lies. You're not going to get far with it. Lola here says, uh, Muslims claim they love and respect Jesus. So when have you ever heard of a jihad attack by Muslims after someone insulted Jesus? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, in fact, that actually brings it, that actually relates to the topic. Um, when, when I was uh, back in college, um, I did a double major in biology and philosophy. And my philosophy uh, 
degree was philosophy with an emphasis in religious studies. So I had to take um, religious studies classes. And my Islam professor was a Muslim. Uh, his name's Muntaz, Muntaz Ahmed. Um, he's passed on now. But he said that they have a saying where he is from. And the saying is, say it about God, but you better not say it about Muhammad. Hmm. Say it about God, but you better not say it about Muhammad. And they're not talking about say nice things about God, but don't say them about Muhammad. They're saying even if you want to say, if you want to say something blasphemous and insulting, you can say it about God, but you better not say it about Muhammad. Right. And that's how Muslims are. I mean, when people when do you hear about the riots over someone making a cartoon, even of God? Someone makes a cartoon. There, there, there are people who make cartoons and they draw God and they draw God with a beard and then uh, they they insult God in various ways. When do you hear of a Muslim riot over that? Um, people make cartoons all the time. I mean, South Park made cartoons of Jesus for years. How many Muslim riots did you hear yeah. over that? As soon as they said, after years, they were going to make a cartoon about Muhammad, that's when they started getting threatened with death. And so all of this goes to show that Muslims who claim, oh, no, 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 we just, we treat all prophets alike, and uh, Muhammad is just a, you know, he's just a human being, he's just a messenger, and so on. They treat Muhammad differently from the way they treat anyone, including God. And why is that? Well, we are going to see if we can get to the bottom of that. Sam, should we, uh, should we, okay. should we jump yes. in? Yes. Now, guys, focus. Don't let the Muslims distract you. And in Jesus' name, we ask the Holy Spirit to guide us to speak accurately, to glorify Jesus and expose Muhammad. Focus. The Muslims turn Muhammad into an ilah with Allah. And you're going to see how. Let's do it. Um, all right. So we'll go ahead and review this clip from Adnan Rashid that we started <clears throat> yesterday because we wanted to we wanted to cover not only what he says about Deuteronomy 33, uh, because you're going to see how he's deifying Muhammad. We want we wanted not only to cover that, uh, so we'll briefly cover that again for the people who weren't here yesterday. Then we'll look at what he says about uh, Muhammad in John 14 through 16, and then we'll look at some other examples of Muslims taking passages from the Bible that are clearly and indisputably about God and the Holy Spirit and applying them to Muhammad while claiming that they are the religion that shuns associating partners with God. Voila, yeah. yeah, it sure is. All right, here we go. Here we go, Sam. It is clearly stated that people of the scripture, the Jews and Christians, can find Muhammad mentioned with them they find him mentioned with them in the Torah and the Gospel. So here it is clear that when God tells the people of the Gospel to judge by what he has revealed therein with that important caveat, he's talking about the passages that have been confirmed by the Quran as true revelations to Jesus and Moses. So it is very clear that chapter 5 verse 47 is talking All right, Sam. Yes, sir. I'm going to leave this up on the screen, and I'm going to hover so over this. So, guys, just so everyone understands the context of this as Adnan is sharing this, uh, I issued a challenge a couple weeks ago, very simple challenge. Show me one unequivocal verse, on one unequivocal statement from Allah in the Quran saying that the gospel has been corrupted. Adnan came out and admitted there is no, the only one he could come up with that he thought was about the gospel was uh, chapter 4, verse 157, which all that says is that the Quran contradicts the gospel. And uh, we have no problem with that. But he admitted that there's, there's, no, there's no unequivocal statement that, that says this. Uh, for some reason, Muslims sent the video anyway, and aha, he refuted you and answered you. For some reason, Muslims think that as long as you say a bunch of words and you make a 15, 20, 30, 40 minute video, that you've been refuted, even if the... 15, 20, 30, 40 minute video hmm. does nothing yeah. to refute you. The, keep in mind, the Islamic definition of a refutation is saying something in response, saying anything in response, whether it answers what you've said or not. That's the Islamic definition, right? That's not our definition. You have to actually show where we're wrong. But uh, Adnan got increasingly desperate because we just kept playing his videos and going through them and showing that he has not answered the question and that what he says actually qualifies him as an apostate because of the things he's saying and he's contradicting his God and his prophet. So then he made this and we went through it and answered all his main arguments. But then he wanted to say that what the Quran is actually saying is that it affirms 
particular parts, remnants, in the Bible, and among the remnants are the prophecies about Muhammad. So the prophecies about Muhammad are the parts you can go to that are still the Word of God. And up here he puts Deuteronomy 18, 18, which only works in an atmosphere of ignorance. Anyone who's read Deuteronomy knows that's talking about Jews. Anyone who's read Deuteronomy knows that when it says a prophet like Moses, this is referring to the power to do miracles and having an intimate face-to-face -face knowledge with God. Um, and people who've read the passage know that just two verses later, Muhammad is completely ruled out as a prophet. He's, 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 he, he can't possibly be a prophet according to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20. So this is bad enough. But what he does in the next verse he posts, in fact, all of the other verses he posts here, Deuteronomy 33, verse 2, uh, Sam, just just go ahead and give us yeah. the Muslim claim. What do Muslims claim about yes. this verse? Because this yes. is not just Adnan. This is all kinds of Muslims. Oh, yeah. Nadim Ahmed again, who doesn't learn. He just repeated and parroted the Muslim claim. I'm looking at the comment section. As you're speaking, I'm hearing. Uh -huh. I'm looking at the comments. And he just said, see, Moses referred to three locations. Folks, if you haven't heard this argument. <clears throat> oh, my goodness. I was, I was first introduced to this argument in the 90s before Internet became popular before YouTube during the 90s you'd have to buy VHS tapes they used to have Betamax I know I'm, we're dating ourselves but VHS tapes and there was a local Muslim bookstore and I would get all the Muslim Christian debates the first time I heard this was from Jamal Badawi who's now quite inactive but in the 80s and 90s he was just as active if not more so than Ahmad Idar here's the argument and Jamal Badawi didn't come up with this I later found out where they got this information from when it says the Lord came from Sinai, right, and mm -hmm. donned, over, uh, donned over them from Seir and <clears throat> shone forth from Mount Paran, they're saying this is referring to the Lord sending three prophets. Sinai, that's Moses and the law. Seir, supposedly Palestine or Israel, that's Jesus. Paran is supposedly Arabia, that's Muhammad. So according, I want to laugh, I mean, according to the Muslim <clears throat> interpretation, these three locations represent three unique and distinct, distinctive laws, legislations from God. One given through Moses, that's Sinai. One given through Jesus, that's Seir. And one given through Muhammad, that's Mount Paran. So it's prophesying the advent of three prophets with three um, unique and distinct <clears throat> legislations, Sharia, that will be overlapping, but also there'll be differences. That's how they interpret this passage, David. Now, um, Sam... <laughs> Yeah. This is hilarious because as you pointed out, you've got, you've got, uh, so here's Nadim Ahmed here, Deuteronomy 33, one through two. There are mention of three locations by Moses, one Sinai, two Seir, and three Paran. Yeah, that, that's, uh, okay. <laughs> that's their, that's their journey that they just took through the wilderness yeah. where you've got this pillar of cloud and pillar of fire, which was the earthly manifestation of Yahweh, the Lord going yep. along on this journey where Sinai, Seir, and Paran. All right. Now, Muslims want to say that this actually refers to Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, and that Paran is not the biblical Paran, but it's uh, it, it refers yeah. to Muhammad down in uh, down in in his area, down in Saudi Arabia. But uh, Sam, notice yeah. the, the other part here. What, what does Jesus have to do with Seir? Nothing. Nothing. No Christian. No Christian that I'm aware of, David. Maybe there has been a Christian. No Christian that I'm aware of has ever pointed to Deuteronomy 33 2 as a prophecy of the advent of the Messiah from Seir and Seir being Palestine. I am not aware of any Christian. Maybe they're there. I wouldn't be surprised because we do have some nut jobs even who profess to be Christians. But do you know of anyone quoting this as a messianic prophecy? No, and, and no, it's just insane. If you look at what's 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 being said here, you have Sinai. That's Mount Sinai. Seir is guys, look up Mount Seir. Look it up. Look up Mount Seir and see what it is. And then you had Mount Paran, right? So God is God is coming over these these great mountains. And Muslims turn this into prophecies about Moses. Now notice, this would be Moses making a prophecy about himself. Um, and then he's prophesying about Jesus in a place where we have no record of Jesus ever going or, or having anything to do with Jesus. And then Mount Paran, which is a place where the Jews just, just went past. The Jews just went there, and somehow it's actually a prophecy about Muhammad in yeah. Arabia. But uh, apart from all of that, ladies and gentlemen, look at what this says, and you understand how blasphemous this is. Shame on you, Nadim. Mm -hmm. Shame on Adnan Rashid. Shame on yep. Jamal Badawi and every Muslim who has ever blasphemed the Lord by saying that this is actually Muhammad. This does not say the Lord 
By the way, when you see Lord in all caps there, that we talked about this yeah. yesterday, when you Yahweh, see Lord in all caps, that is Yahweh, that is the God of the Bible. So, the God of the Bible came from Sinai and dawned over them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. So, this is talking about God. This does not say God yes. sent a prophet from Sinai. Later, he sent a prophet from Mount Seir, even though Jesus was, we have no record of Jesus ever being at Mount Seir. And uh, instead of the Mount Paran that we just passed on the journey, it's actually talking about uh, Muhammad. This doesn't say the Lord sent prophets. It says the Lord came from Sinai. The Lord exactly. dawned over them from Seir. The Lord shone forth from Mount Paran, right? Why? Right. You just saw a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud going going forth from all these places. Mm -hmm. And so the notice, Muslims. I understand a Muslim in the comment section, like Nadim, who's never studied anything and has no clue what he's talking about, hearing a Muslim apologist say, yeah, it, it, talks, uh, it talks about three places, it mentions three places, and these are talking about Moses and Jesus and Muhammad, and never thinking that he needs to question this. I understand that. But when you're Jamal Badawi and you've read this passage, when you're Adnan Rashid and you've read this passage, I can only conclude that you are completely blasphemous in your attempts to deify your own prophet, and that your religion is utter, complete paganism at its core. That's all That's I can right. conclude. If it produces apologists who will lie about the text like this and blasphemously claim that this is actually talking about Muhammad here, you're calling Muhammad yeah. the Lord. This is this is this is bad stuff. Anything else you wanted to add before we? Uh... Yeah, I want them to understand. This is what we call guys. Pay attention by the grace of Jesus Christ, because you're going to have to learn these arguments to refute Muslims. And someone asked me set up a debate with Hamza Mayat. Anytime, any place, even on the crucifixion, because they've been butchering the New Testament to try to deny the crucifixion, I'll embarrass him for that by the grace of Jesus. But guys, pay attention to what this is. This is what we'd call Moses' swan song, so to speak. These are the final inspired words of Moses right as he's about to die. Guys, understand what this is. And he's reminding the Israelites of the goodness of Yahweh, the goodness of Jehovah, in being with them, <clears throat> in the midst of them for those 40 years to oversee them and preserve them. Now, write these verses down. We mentioned them yesterday. I won't read them. I just may read one or two about where Mount Paran and Sierra happen to be. It's in the desert, in the wilderness, the locations that the Israelites encamped at and came to for the 40 years in the wilderness. But write these down because this is where Muslims don't understand that according to the Pentateuch, God himself personally and visibly showed up in time and space in full view of the Israelites to accompany Moses and bringing them out of Egypt into the wilderness and eventually into the promised land. Write these down. Exodus 13, verses 21 and 22. Exodus 13, verses 21 and 22. Exodus 14, verses 19 to 20, and 24 to 28. Exodus 14, verses 19 to 20, 24 to 28. Exodus chapter 19, the entire chapter, but start at verse 9. Exodus 19, verse 9, Exodus 19, verse 11, and Exodus 19, same chapter, verses 16 to 24, and then two more for the sake of brevity. Exodus 33, 7 to 11, Exodus 33, 7 to 11, and Exodus 40, verses 34 to 38. Exodus 40, verses 34 to 38. Folks, just read those passages. It says that God appeared in a pillar of cloud by day. So the Egyptians saw a pillar of cloud by day, and the Israelites saw a pillar of cloud by day that appeared as a pillar of fire. And they knew that God was in that cloud, in that fire, because in Exodus 19, Exodus 20, they heard the voice of God audibly, loudly, speaking from the cloud so literally god was there god did come from sinai god did dawn over them in sierra god did shine forth from mount paran because these are the locations in the wilderness where the israelites encamp god was actually there so journeying with the israelites overseeing them preserving them it wasn't god <clears throat> raising up prophets at different times with different legislations for different dispensations it's talking about the blessing of Jehovah upon his people, being with them for those 40 years. And the second element, I need to emphasize this. I know we want to go to the other points, but still, I need to emphasize this. Notice the latter part of the verse. He came with myriads of holy ones from the south 
from his mountain slopes. Now, Muslims dishonestly say, uh -huh. and David, this is what they say. They go that this means Muhammad entering Medina with 10,000 jihadis. Wouldn't, but that, folks, wouldn't that be from the north? Wouldn't that be from the north, Sam? Yes, from the north. But here's what's worse, David. Here's what's worse. Remember, folks, they're trying to tell you this is referring to Jesus. That means they have to be able to demonstrate that somehow Jesus also entered Jerusalem or some location when 10,000 ones. Because remember, they're saying it's not just about Muhammad. It's mm -hmm. about Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. So pray tell in the Gospels where you can find any time Jesus entered any place, let's say Jerusalem or even Galilee, with 10,000 disciples. Where do you find it? You won't. Because the myriads here, don't take my word for it, folks. Please check me up on this. Write down Psalm 68, 17 to 18. I'm almost done. Psalm 68, verses 17, 18. Please write these down. Read them. Review them for yourselves. Psalm 68, 17 to 18. <clears throat> Acts 7, verse 53. Acts 7, verse 53. Galatians 3, 19. Galatians 3, verse 19. Hebrews 2, verse 2. There you're going to be told explicitly. God, when he showed up in time and space to accompany Moses, he showed up with his myriads, his angels. The myriads of holy ones is a reference to God's angelic host that came down with God during that period to assist God and Israel. That's what these passages teach. And if you want further proof, myriads of holy ones refers to the angels, not human jihadis or human disciples. Further proof, Daniel 7 verse 10. Daniel 7, verse 10, Hebrews 12, 22, Hebrews 12, 22, Revelation 5, 11, it says that the host in heaven that stand in attention before God are myriads, myriads of myriads using the same language. End of story has nothing to do with Muhammad or his jihadi thugs. Yeah, guys, I mean, do you have any idea? Again, since Muslims just do not seem to get the point and how wicked and repulsive this is to Christians who see you guys doing this stuff. Again, imagine me going to the Quran, taking some verses that are clearly and indisputably about Allah doing something and to say, this is actually talking about me. You would be horrified. You would, you would, you would never trust me again. You would say David Wood is complete trash and garbage for taking a passage that is clearly about God and saying it's about him. That's what you guys do. That's what your apologists do. That's what the guys that you say, oh, this person can refute you. That's what they do. And it's at the core of your religion. Look, the Lord, that's Yahweh, came from Sinai and dawned over them from Seir and shone forth from Mount Paran. He, what do you mean he? I thought it's they, because it's referring to three people, isn't it? He came yeah. with myriads of holy ones. Your, your, your interpretation makes no sense. Why do Muslims do this? Because they're absolutely desperate. They know their prophet claimed to be prophesied in our book, and yet after 14 centuries of trying to find where, the best <laughs> passages they have are ones that are talking about God, and they're saying uh, that, they, that they're, they're putting Muhammad in here. So, so according to our Muslim friends, the Bible clearly is talking about Muhammad, but it keeps saying God. It keeps saying God when it's talking about Muhammad. And that's what they're telling us. And these are the best ones they've come up with. I mean, we're, we're, we're assuming that, that Adnan and all these guys are using their best ones and that they don't have these other ones that are really good, but they don't use, right? Yep. All right. So let's go on. Let's go on to the next one, Sam. Yep. And a lot of people don't understand how blasphemous this is as well, but he quotes Deuteronomy 14 and Deuteronomy, I mean, uh, John 14 and John 16, Sam. So oh, boy. let's go ahead. Yeah. It's up on the screen here. We'll, we'll take these passages in turn because Sam, I don't, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. don't know why they continue quoting John 16, 7 after we've already shown that they've just acknowledged, they've just acknowledged that uh, this would make Jesus the God of Muhammad. But we'll get to that in a second. So John 14. 15 through 17, if you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. So according to Adnan Rashid and to many other Muslims, this is what Zakir Naik uses, this is what DDOT uses. If you if you get a Quran and it, you've got commentary on, uh, on Surah 7, verse 157, and where Muhammad is prophesied, this is the go-to passage. Jamal Badawi, Shabir Ali, they all use, use yep. this passage. 
Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. Now we don't even we don't need we don't even need to say whether this is talking about Muhammad or not. If Muslims are claim Sam, if, if Muslims are claiming that this is actually referring to Muhammad, that this passage is about Muhammad, have they just once again yes. deified Muhammad and ascribed divine attributes to him? Yes, they they have deified Muhammad and also demonstrated. Guys, understand the argument because this is an argument David has made. He's got sessions on it, and one and one response to Zechariah, right? You even have a video where you respond to Zechariah's misuse of these various passages to show that Zechariah ends up creating problems, which I am sure, if he thought about, he would think twice about using. Now, f folks, if we go with these passages, Muslims end up proving Muhammad is divine, and also that Jesus and the Father are divine, and that they have authority over Muhammad. <clears throat> And related to that, they prove that the Quran has been corrupted by Muhammad's followers and that Muhammad's theology was changed because Muhammad taught one thing, but his followers changed his message, corrupted it to have him say something completely different. Now, what do I mean by that? Now, <clears throat> guys, understand <clears throat> the point I'm about to make. We've made this argument in the past. Like I said, it's good to hear something over and over again until it becomes second nature by the grace of God because we want you to learn these arguments, use them to glorify Jesus. All right. If you read the prophecies in John 14, 17, Jesus says about the comforter, and this is what Adnan was twisting, and you even have it on the screen. He, this is the passage he quoted, John 14, 15 to 17. But if you finish verse 17, it says, it says that <clears throat> you know him. It says the world does not know him, the world does not see him, but you know him because he's with you and shall be in you. Folks, let's just unpack verse 17. Notice what Jesus said to disciples about the spirit of truth. The world does not know him because it cannot see him. But many people did see Muhammad in the 7th century. But let's put that aside. Forget that. Let's put that aside. Jesus then says to the disciples, but you know him. He's with you. Notice the text says he's with you and shall be in you. Okay, number one. If this is Muhammad, Muslims, are you telling us that Muhammad pre-existed his birth? So you're affirming the pre-human existence of Muhammad? Because Jesus said that the spirit of truth is already with you. And you know he's with you because he's working in and through me. And it makes sense if this is the Holy Spirit. Because in John 1, 32-33, John 1, verses 32-33, says the Holy Spirit came down in bodily shape like a dove. And John the Baptist saw it and rested on Jesus and alighted on him. Because the Holy Spirit worked in union with Christ to do the miracles that Christ did and preach the words that the Father sent Jesus to preach. So it makes sense for Jesus to say, you know him because he's with me, he works through me. The miracles I do, I do in union with him. The words I speak, I speak in union with him. The Spirit and I work together in revealing the Father's words to you. But then he says he'll be in you. Okay. If the Spirit is going to, going to be in all disciples, that means the Spirit is not bound to time and space. The Spirit is omnipresent. And the reason why he's going to be in the disciples, because the, the Holy Spirit is going to empower disciples to do the works that Jesus had been doing while he was on earth and spread the message of the kingdom all over the world. That means the Spirit is omnipresent and <clears throat> omnipotent. Because he's going to be with all of them and empower them to successfully accomplish the mission of Christ. So Muslims, here's what you end up with. The pre-human existence of Muhammad. Muhammad was already there. And that Muhammad is omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. You just turned Muhammad into a, a divine person along with the Father and the Son. And I'll unpack that in a moment. But if you want to add something or clarify, David, go ahead. I actually wanted to check out... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Nadim. Nadim keeps talking about how he studies and all these things. Uh, check out this comment here. He says, advocate or counselor or Ahmed, you should learn correct Greek word. Well, the correct Greek <laughs> word, the correct Greek word, uh, Nadim, is <laughs> parakletos, and it means advocate or counselor or helper. That's why you can translate it. Now, this is amazing, Sam. I could pick up different Qurans and, and get different translations. Anytime we go 
Anytime we point out something, the Quran or the Hadith say, we get Muslims saying, oh, but the word can be translated in all these different ways, blah, 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 blah. As soon as we, as soon as someone starts translating the Bible, they say, what is it? What about this other translation, right? Nadine, this is completely irrelevant. Look at what you're saying. You're, you're questioning the translation. This is the translation that, that your apologist is using. We didn't put this on the screen. Exactly. That's this. Exactly. This is what Adnan Rashid put on the put on in his video. So he went with that translation. He went with that translation. And you whine and what are, are you saying? It's Ahmed. There is no Bible. There, there no no one says Ahmed, right? Hmm. It's it's Parakletos. What are you talking about? Stop saying that you study if you have no clue what you're talking about, yeah. and you're defending some of the most ridiculous points ever defended by anyone. Let, let me go ahead and put this up on the screen here for a second. Yeah. And again, uh, he doesn't understand. Let's even for argument's sake, it doesn't mean Ahmed. But even if it means Ahmed, that's what it's supposed to mean. You still don't understand the implication of your argument. Did you hear what we had to say, Nadim? Mm -hmm. That means Ahmed existed in the first century. Mm -hmm. Ahmed was there, present with Jesus, active with Jesus, before the seventh century. That means you're affirming that your Ahmed, whom you say is Muhammad, existed before he became flesh so now you're you're affirming two incarnations the incarnation of the word in jesus and the incarnation of the spirit who's muhammad centuries later so do you believe muhammad slash ahmed was there with jesus operating in union with jesus and that the disciples saw the works of ahmed and that muhammad then indwelt the disciples filled the disciples and empowered them. Is that what you believe, Nadim? Even if we go with Ahmed, do you believe that? Say yes, Muhammad was there, Ahmed was there as a disembodied spirit, right? Because he didn't become flesh yet. And yes, Ahmed, my prophet, indwelt the disciples and empowered them to do miracles because Ahmed is divine and he's great. Mm -hmm. Yay! Yeah, uh, so, so uh, Nadim, I hope you're understanding. Just look at the words in this passage and try to understand from a Christian perspective why we can only regard your apologists as completely deceptive, completely blasphemous pagans when they say that this yeah. is about Muhammad. Complete, exactly. utter pagan worship of Muhammad. When you, when you take a passage that is clearly about a person of the Trinity, God, and you say, this is about Muhammad, duh, right? You sound completely blasphemous to us. Look at the passage. Yeah, yeah. For once in your life, Nadim, for once, don't look at this and say, how can I insert Muhammad into this passage? Think, if I insert Muhammad into this passage, what have I just claimed about Muhammad? Think that for one second, because you never do. You never, yeah. you never, th you never thought that when you read Deuteronomy 33, verse 2. You never thought, what have I just said about Muhammad if I claim that... Th that Muhammad is Lord, that he is Yahweh, right? You never, it's just, oh, it, it mentions a place. Uh, I can say that's Muhammad, right? That's all you think, right? And here, oh, Jesus is saying someone else is, someone else is about to come. Oh, great. Let's say that that's about Muhammad and completely ignore what the passage says. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Verse 16, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, to be with you, to be with who? Jesus is talking to his apostles here. Did you did you pay to, did you pay attention to anything Sam just said? He will give you my apostles another helper to be with you forever. So Muhammad was with Jesus apostles forever. Even the spirit of truth. So Muhammad is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him. Up oh, no one can see Muhammad, he's invisible. That's right. Nor knows him. You know him. Who? You. Who who's you here? He's talking to his apostles. You know him. Abu Bakr. Yeah, you apostles know him, they know Muhammad, for he dwells with you. Muhammad dwells with the apostles and will be in you. He will be in them? What the heck are you talking about? If we yeah. scroll down, if we scroll down, what do we have? These things I have spoken to you, verse 25, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you, who? The apostles, all things, and brings you remembrance all that I have said to you. So, going with the interpretation of Anan and Nadim here, these things I have spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the helper, so that's Muhammad, right? The Holy Spirit. So, Muhammad is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father, wait a minute, I thought Allah's a father to no one. Who's this father? But the helper, 
Muhammad, the Holy Spirit. So Muhammad is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father, which completely contradicts Islam, will send in my name, in the name of Jesus. So the Father, who doesn't exist in Islam, sent Muhammad, who is the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. He will teach you all things. So Muhammad, the Holy Spirit, sent in the name of Jesus by the Father, who doesn't exist in Islam, Brought to, remem brought to the remembrance of the apostles all that Jesus said to them? How can you say with a straight face, Nadine? How can anyone say with a straight face that this is talking about Muhammad? How can, you have to, how can you not recognize the blasphemy? Guess what? Everyone in the chat right now who has not mindlessly, yeah. mindlessly following Muhammad without any sort of reason, anyone else... Can look at this and say you're set you guys are saying that's muhammad are you joking yeah. here you're saying that muhammad is the holy spirit sent by the father in the name of jesus notice guys notice what you have here father sending the spirit in the name of jesus this passage is thoroughly trinitarian you can't understand Man. or make sense of this passage apart from the doctrine of the trinity muslims go right to a passage that's about the doctrine of the trinity and they say, oh, that's Muhammad. We're going to insert Muhammad into this passage about the doctrine of the Trinity. This yeah. is a classic Trinitarian passage. You go right here, insert Muhammad in there, and you say that Muhammad is a member of the Trinity. That Muhammad has the divine attributes. You blasphemous, blasphemous pagans, and your religion convinces you to do this. This is this is hilarious. Go ahead, sir. But, but David, it's going to get worse. Oh, yeah? You can show them on the screen in John 15, 26. Guys, it's going to get worse. In John 15, 26, I know there's a delay by the time it comes up, but guys, pay attention. Please memorize what David said, these arguments. Please, because then you're going to <clears throat> silence this nonsense, this blasphemous nonsense that Muhammad is the spirit of truth. Because in John 15, 26, notice what it says. But when the counselor comes, you want to say comforter, helper, fine, whom I, I shall send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will bear witness of me. Now, folks, pay attention to what David already said. The father sends the spirit of truth, the counselor, in the name of Jesus, meaning on behalf of Jesus for the sake of Jesus. But then Jesus says, I also will be sending him. Guys, pay attention to the union between father and son. I, with the father, will be sending the spirit of truth, the counselor, from where? Not from the earth, not from the womb of Amina. This spirit of truth comes forth from the Father, proceeds from the Father. So now notice two factors again. Father and Jesus, the Father, Son, together send the spirit of truth. And where do they send them from? From the Father. Now, as David said, Islam anathematizes anyone who says Allah is the Father. Mm -hmm. But again, let's put that aside. I want to ask a question. Muslims, here's the question I want you to answer. According to you, the one who sent Jesus, whom we call the Father, though you don't believe he's the Father, that's Allah. Where is Allah? Now, if you're a Salafi, you're going to tell me Allah is above the seven heavens, above the throne. But notice Jesus says, I'm going to send the spirit of truth from the Father. Now, if you believe the Father is Allah, even though you don't call him the Father, that means this spirit of truth is there with Allah above the seven heavens, above the throne. So if this is Muhammad, Ahmed, you just affirmed your Ahmed, Muhammad, was already existing with Allah on Allah's throne above creation and then came into the earth. Do you really want to say that? Do you really want to say that this is Muhammad who was there before he became flesh from his mother Amina? He was there. He was alive. He was existing consciously with Allah above the, the seven heavens, above the throne, and that Jesus then sent him from the throne. And then John 16, 14 and 15 gets worse, folks, because in John 16, 14 and 15, Jesus says that he will glorify me. He will take what is mine and make it to, known to you. And then he says in 15 something beautiful. All that the Father has is mine. This is why I say that when the spirit of truth comes, he will make that known to you. In other words, he will convince you of this truth. He will confirm in your hearts to believe and have no doubt, I am the beloved son who owns everything that belongs to the father. Okay, Muslims, according to you, Allah sent Muhammad, number one. And Muhammad preached in the name of Allah, number two. And he glorified Allah, number three. So guys, pay attention. Muhammad was sent by Allah. 
Muhammad proclaimed in the name of Allah, by the authority of Allah, and glorified Allah. But Jesus said, the spirit of truth will glorify me, and he comes in my name, and I and the Father will send him. So if Muhammad is the counselor, Muhammad sent by Allah, in the name of Allah, to glorify Allah. But the counselor is sent by the Father and the Son, in the name of the Son, to glorify the Son. You just made Muhammad's Allah, the Father and the Son. Father and Son are the one God, Allah, that sent Muhammad, the counselor, in the name of Jesus, the Son, to glorify Jesus, the Son, as Allah, which means you corrupted the Quran, because the Quran says Allah is not the Father, Jesus is not the Son, and Jesus didn't say Muhammad. You wicked, evil Muslims, you truly did shred the Quran, because in 1591 it says there were people that shredded the Quran, and here's proof, you shredded the Quran, you perverted the Quran, because Muhammad went around saying, my Allah is the Father and the Son. Jesus is Allah with the Father. They are my God who sent me, and I glorify Jesus, who is Allah. But you changed the Quran to make him deny all that. Shame on you, you pathetic Quran perverters. All right. Um, now, Sam, we actually had, we actually had from our good friend, Adnan Rashid, let me see if I can get this back up because I wanted to show, I wanted to show what he, uh, that he actually went to John 16, 7. <laughs> like, how do they keep, how do they, it's amazing. I've seen really Shabir, amazing. I've seen Shabir Ali quote that. I've seen Zakir Knight quote that. And they never, ever think about the meaning. Why? They don't have to because they know their viewers are not going to look at it. So uh, let me see if I can get this back here. Or if I have to start the video over again, let's see. And God tells the people of the gospel to judge by what he has revealed therein with that important caveat. He's talking about the passages that. All right. So I've got this back up on the screen and <laughs> Sam, you'll see it. You'll see it in a second. But Adnan actually puts it as one of the examples of his prophecies about Muhammad. John 16, 7 to 8. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. So Jesus is talking to his apostles here. He says it's it's for their good that he's going away. Unless I go away, the advocate or helper or comforter, whom Muslims say is Muhammad, unless I go away, Muhammad will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Thank you. So I will send him to you. I will send him. Jesus sends Muhammad Sam. Since I, I don't I, I don't know if they caught it. I know Nadim, uh, you can point something out 50 times to him. He still yeah, doesn't get, get it. it. Yeah. Sam, according to Islam... Who sent Muhammad? Yes, and I just said it, but again... No, I know, I know, I know. We, 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 yeah, we will I have to repeat, repeat this ten times. Because yeah. I want it to sink mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. by the power of the Holy Spirit. Folks, understand what Adnan Rashid just did. He quotes the passage to show, Jesus says, When I go, I will send him to you. But then that's the same chapter too. Let me add this again, repeat it again. In that same chapter, Jesus says, if I go, I will send him to you. I will send him to you. And then 14 and 15, same Jesus, same chapter says, he, that spirit of truth, whom I will send to you, will glorify me. For he'll receive from me and will declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and will declare it to you. So let's walk through this again, Muslims. And Christians, remember these points. Jesus says, when I go... I will send them to you, and I will send them to you to glorify me and to confirm and convince you everything the Father owns belongs to me. So again, if Jesus sent the counselor, and they're telling me that's Ahmed Muhammad, but then they're telling me Allah sent Muhammad. Folks, you understand what you just did? You just proved Jesus is the God of Muhammad. He's the Allah of Muhammad. So anytime you worship Allah, you're worshiping Jesus because Jesus is the one who sent your Ahmed. You're saying this spirit of truth is Muhammad. Jesus says, I will send him. But you're telling me Allah sent Muhammad, not Jesus. Well, you can't have your cake and eat it too. If Allah sent Muhammad and Jesus is the one who sends Muhammad, because that's what you said. He's the spirit of truth. Jesus says, I will send him. 
Jesus has to be Muhammad's God. He is Allah. You're worshiping Jesus as Allah. And further proof he's Allah, Muhammad glorified Allah. He glorified him. But Jesus says, the spirit of truth will glorify me. So if Muhammad glorified Allah, and Muhammad is the spirit of truth, and the Allah that the spirit of truth glorifies is Jesus, thank you for again showing Jesus is Allah, the God of Muhammad, who sent Muhammad, whom Muhammad glorifies. And then finally, do you guys believe that Jesus owns everything that the Father possesses? Because he says, all that the Father has is mine. Whatever the Father owns belongs to Jesus. The Father owns all creation. Jesus says, it's mine. I own all of it, which means he owns all you Muslims. He owns your properties. He owns your lands. He owns your Muhammad. Do you believe this? If you do, you again prove that you corrupted your Quran, you changed your Quran, you perverted your Quran, because there's no way Muhammad could have went around saying, Allah is not the Father and the Son, because Jesus and the Father send the counselor. And if Muhammad is the counselor, then he would surely know the God who's sending me is the Father and the Son. They are the one Allah, and I worship them. So then how does your Quran say, Allah is not the Father, Jesus is not the Son, if it came from Muhammad? Here's proof your Quran is not from Muhammad. Shame on you, tools of the devil, for corrupting the message of Muhammad. There you go. All right. Now, notice what we have here. Let me go ahead and put this passage up one more time, uh, just so we can see the other verses Sam was talking about. Notice, ladies and gentlemen, Adnan was the one who put John 16 verses 7 to 8 up on the screen to show that this is a prophecy about Muhammad. Do you under, does everyone just, un, now I know pretty much everyone here understands what's going on. For some reason, there is a kind of spiritual blindness um, on many Muslims. And you, even if you say it 20 times, even if you say it 20 times, they still do not get it. So we want to, we want to go ahead, take a look at the passage again. All right. Let me put the passage up on the screen. Verses 7 to 8. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Notice, let's, let's just read the passage right up to verse 15. Yep. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, that's Muhammad, remember, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send, I, Jesus, will send. And we know from John 14 that Father and Son together send the Holy Spirit. The Amen. Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit, whom Muslims are claiming is actually Muhammad, who proceeds from the Father, who does not exist according to Islam. Hmm. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father. What? I, I thought I thought Allah is a Father to no one. Because I mm -hmm. go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, once again, the spirit of truth, he will guide you into all the truth. So, oh, you see that? Muhammad's going to guide everyone into all the truth. Oh, but wait a second. Jesus is talking to his apostles here. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to, he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me. So Muhammad will glorify Jesus, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So Muhammad will take what is Jesus's and declare it to the apostles. All that the Father has is mine. This is Jesus saying that all that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So, as Sam pointed out, Muhammad belongs to God. Everything belongs to God. And Jesus says all that the Father has is mine. So here you have Jesus saying that everything that belongs to the Father is the personal private property of Jesus. Thank you. Muslims go to this passage, which <laughs> cannot be understood apart from the doctrine of the Trinity. They go right smack dab into the middle of the Gospel of John, which is saturated with teachings about the deity of Christ. They go to a passage where Jesus unfolds and unpacks the doctrine of the Trinity for them. They go right into the middle there and they say, you see that third person of the Trinity? The Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father, who is sent by the Father and the Son together? That's Muhammad. 
<laughs> and they do not understand <laughs> how blasphemous they are. So, <laughs> so d does 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 everyone else? Hang on, hang on. And I want to show you that someone's seeing it—a Muslim who's on his door to becoming Christian. So as you're saying it, yep. Muhammad ibn Jars, he said, Acts 17 apologetics. Yes, this is a very bad argument. The danger of it, I can see. There you go. So Holy Spirit's working in Muslims, folks. Here's a Muslim that the Holy Spirit is touching to show him how bad these arguments are. Mm -hmm. He's on his way to worshiping Jesus. And that's our goal. So uh, Muslims here. Muslims here. Tell us. Is this about Muhammad? Is this passage about Muhammad? Tell us one. Is this about Muhammad? And uh, if so, are you admitting that Muhammad is your God? And keep in mind, it's not just here, right? If you say if you if you say Muhammad is the the comforter or helper in John 14, you've just deified him there. If you say he's, he's in in John 16, you you've deified him there. If you say he's the Lord in Deuteronomy 33, you've deified him there. If you yeah. say he's God in Habakkuk 3:3, you've just deified him there. If you, you you keep deifying him left and right, so tell us one mm -hmm. is that about is that passage is Jesus talking about Muhammad? In the Gospel of John, that's one. Two, uh, do you understand how you've just declared that Muhammad is is God, and that Muhammad is the third person of the Trinity? Yep. And three, if you don't think that, if you actually are a Muslim looking at that, going, "Whoa, I did not know what that passage was about. I just heard from lying Muslim apologists all my life that this is actually talking about Muhammad, but it never occurred to me to actually read it and see how it completely contradicts what they're saying and that they just deified Muhammad. Why don't you tell us if your do you think Zakir Naik read that passage? I think he did. Yeah, do you think Ahmed definitely. Didat? Do you think Ahmed Didat read that passage? I think he did. Do you think Shabir Ali and Jamal Badawi and Adnan Rashid have all read that passage? I think they have. So tell me what kind of apologists and defenders does Islam produce if your greatest apologists and defenders you go to this passage and say that it's about Muhammad and they leave out any discussion of all of these things that show that the, the person of the Trinity who's being talked about here is divine? So those, so those three things. One, do you still think this is talking about Muhammad? Two, do you understand yeah. that you've just called Muhammad God? Do you understand the implications? And three, if you don't, if you don't think that it's talking about Muhammad, do, do you want? Can you tell us why your apologists all say that it does? Yeah. And how? And why we should not regard them as complete deceivers, as complete deceivers, and as completely blasphemous people who are trying to deify their own prophet? Do you see that? And and just one one more time, guys. Imagine, imagine. Me. Suppose you walk into a room and you see me speaking to some people and I'm telling them all I'm a prophet and I'm saying that I'm confirmed in the Quran and you and you know the verses that I'm quoting. You wouldn't because Muslims don't read the Quran, but pretend, imagine that you knew the Quran. Suppose I'm talking to a room full of, of Christians and I'm convincing them that I'm a prophet. And the, the people don't the people there don't know the verses I'm quoting from the, and from the Quran. I'm quoting verses of the Quran to try and establish to Christians who don't know what it says. I'm using the Quran to show that I'm a prophet, but I'm quoting verses that are actually about God. And I'm saying that's me without telling the people there. And imagine they're all going, they don't know that they don't know the Quran. Imagine they're just sitting there going, wow, David is prophesied in the Quran. This is amazing. Maybe we should serve him. Imagine that. Imagine how completely repulsed you would be. Imagine what you would think of me. Get that through your mind and then try to get your mind around what we see when we see all of your main apologists doing that with the Bible, going to passages that are clearly and indisputably about God or about one person of the Trinity, and you insert Muhammad in there and say, that's our prophet, and you do this to ignorant people who don't know what the Bible says. How can we regard these people as anything other than utter total blasphemous deceivers? who are trying to deify their prophet. Go ahead and explain that for me. Be interested in hearing what you have to say. Yeah, but one thing I just got to correct you. What? It's not Muhammad. It's Ahmed. Yeah. <laughs> What's wrong with you, David? The guy correct you say, it's Ahmed, David. Yeah. Surprise, David. Surprise, surprise. Yeah, that's it. All right. Surprise, David. Yeah. All right, Sam, sh should I go ahead and take up uh, 
Yeah, I mean, was that it? That's all you had? No, 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 no. I have a, yeah, that, that, that's what Adnan had. That's what I'm saying. Adnan, that was it? That was his best case? I don't know if he went to anything else later in the video, but I think that was his case. Mm. Wow. Those were his uh, biblical prophecies about Muhammad. Notice, he quoted, he cited four passages. He cited four passages. Three out of the four call Muhammad God. Three out of the four passages that he went to call Muhammad God. And Muslims have no problem with this, right? Now, guys, I just want to say, if you were really the religion of pure monotheism, if you were really the religion of strict Tawheed, and you were not the religion that associates partners with God, if you were what you claim to be, that man's career would be over. His career would be over. Muslims would rise up and say, and not I'm not just talking about him. Muslims would rise up and say, Shabir Ali, Zakir Naik, Adnan Rashid, all of you guys who are deifying Muhammad, we're done with you because you're corrupting our religion. Yeah. Guys, keep What's in mind, happening? they're all they're What's all happening? they're all mushriks. They're these guys we, we make we make entire videos saying these guys are all apostates. They're all mustr they're all mushriks. They are the mushrikun. They're all they're all making Muhammad this partner with God. They're saying that he's in the Trinity. And Muslims don't care. Don't tell me about your religion when you're this pagan. All right. <laughs> By the way, you know, it's interesting, what? David, talk about God's glorious timing because our God is real. Jesus is alive. He's real. Uh -huh. I found out earlier today on Facebook, Shabir Ali was going to do a live stream on Sh uh, Facebook. Did uh -huh. Jesus speak of another prophet to come? Hmm. <laughs> oh, really? I, I, I didn't listen to it. Yeah, I didn't listen to it. But if you want. We could take it. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Guys, Shabir Ali did a live stream on his Facebook page. If you guys want us to tackle it, because he's going to try to appeal to liberal critical scholarship where dissects the Gospel of John into layers in order to deceitfully, dishonestly, and deceptively argue that in the original saying of Jesus, he prophesied a prophet to come. I didn't listen to it, but I saw the announcement. Like, irony of ironies, David. Yep. We're doing a session exposing this lie that Jesus predicted the coming of Muhammad. And we'll be more than happy to take And again, open challenge. Shirali, I'll debate you on those topics as well. Mm -hmm. Will you take me up on it? Any time, any place, by the power of Jesus Christ, those three topics, let's do it. But go ahead. And, and actually, uh, actually, Sam, actually, Sam, uh, we'll probably end up covering a lot on the so-called biblical prophecies of Muhammad because that's going to be my next uh, no Muslim can answer this question challenge. And the question is going to be, give us a clear, unequivocal statement in the Bible declaring that Muhammad's a prophet. Because Sam, you've read this. It's not just the Quran. If you go to the Hadith, you go to the Sirah, the Muslims ran around amongst themselves saying, oh yeah, the Christians, the Jews, they all look at the Bible and they see Muhammad everywhere and they're just, they're just denying it. So according hmm. to the Muslim sources, it's clear and indisputable. Well, then it, obviously we can ask for which ones. So I'm going to go ahead and ask for which ones, but then we can do live streams going, going through them all. Um, all right, should we, uh, we have, notice this is actually good timing here. Mm -hmm. uh, Alejandro says, Muslims like to use Isaiah 42 for Muhammad. Can you, David, or Sam help? Um, <laughs> hey, th this is actually perfect because I had pulled up, I had pulled up a screenshot from the Merciful Servant video. So go ahead and check this out, Alejandro. This is a, I, I took, I, I may, I've made two videos about this. Let me get this up on the screen here, and uh, there we go. Isaiah 42, 13. Notice the dot, dot, dot. So this is from Isaiah 42. Notice the dot, dot, dot. That's when you're leaving something out. And if you're if you're an honest person, you can leave out something that's that's kind of irrelevant to to the topic because you know it's it's got nothing to do with the topic. If you're deceptive, you cut out something that completely refutes you. Or completely destroys your argument or shows that you're a liar right so this is from the merciful servant channel this is as far as i know the most popular muslim channel on the planet isaiah 42 13 right they're, they're they're arguing that that muhammad is mentioned in isaiah 42 and they put this passage up on the screen and they say, this special person will go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. And they say that this is about Muhammad. They say that this is actually about Muhammad. That, that it's about Muhammad going forth as a mighty man. Muhammad stirring up jealousy. Muhammad going out like a man of war. 
if you read Isaiah 42, what they took out there, the dot, 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 yeah, is that it's 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 Yahweh again. It's exactly. God, God, the God of the Bible goes forth as a mighty man, right? They take that out. They cut that part out. And they tell their viewers that this is actually talking about Muhammad. Notice Deuteronomy 33.2. They say it's about Muhammad. Well, that's about God. Habakkuk 3.3. They say that's about Muhammad. Well, that's about God. Isaiah 42.13. They say this is about Muhammad. It's about God. The, uh, the the passages in John 14 and 16, those are about the Holy Spirit. They say that's about Muhammad. These guys are deifying Muhammad like it's a sport. And they claim to be the religion of the pure worship of God that, that never associates partners with God. Guys, this religion is a joke. This is this is at its core. How are these guys not called out? And Sam, you know what's amazing about this, about this passage here? What's amazing about this passage is in, uh, in Isaiah 42, verse 13. I posted a video about that a long time ago. The And I pointed out a typo in the title. There was a typo in the title. I po In my video, I said, hey, there's a typo in the title. I went back to it months later. They had corrected the typo, so they saw my, so they saw my video. They saw my video, which exposed how they just called Muhammad the God of the Bible. That video is still up. You can go right now to Merciful Servant. Type in Merciful Servant, Muhammad in the Bible. That video is going to pop up. The video is still there. So they watch my video. They know that the video calls Muhammad God. They do not care. They do not care that there is a video on their channel calling Muhammad Yahweh, the God of yeah. the Bible. They do not care, right? I could understand if someone did it in complete ignorance. Maybe he is the sloppiest reader in the history of humanity, and he just, oops, Maybe that part was act. Maybe he had uh, had a sharpie and he messed up and was scratching around and didn't realize that he scratched out the word Yahweh there. But notice, to make that video, to put the dot 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 there, you read the passage. You yeah. saw that this is talking about God. Exactly. You deliberately took it out and then convinced your listeners, your listeners, that this is actually talking about Muhammad because you know that they will never look that passage up. They will mindlessly believe everything you say. So here's what I see, ladies and gentlemen. I see Muslim leaders, Muslim apologists, all of them, all of them across the board, going to passages of the Bible, claiming that Muhammad is God, telling their followers that these passages, which are about God, are actually about Muhammad, knowing that no one in their community is ever going to look these passages up and challenge them. And they know they can get away with it. They know they can get away with it because the only people who are going to call them out, Muslims aren't going to call them out for deifying Muhammad. We're going to call them out for deifying Muhammad. But Muslims won't listen to us, no matter how many, no matter how clearly we expose them. Muslims still continue mindlessly believing the people that are saying, "Yep, our prophet is God." What is this religion? It's yeah. grounded in deception and deification of Muhammad and paganism and kissing black stone and bowing down to a, a cube. You're doing everything the pagans did, every bit of it, but much more effectively than the pagans ever did it, and bragging, this is the religion of pure monotheism. Now let's go out and find a bunch of passages about God and say they're about our prophet. This is ridiculous, guys. You're, <laughs> uh, Sam, if I, were to, if I were to write like a story about the, the the most ridiculous, nonsensical, impossible situation to ever arise. It would be this religion claiming to be pure monotheism while constantly deifying Muhammad yeah. and having the focus on kissing a black stone and all these pagan practices. This is, this. It's I mean, it's hilarious, but, but it's so sad. David, that's a surprise. But now, uh, joking aside, I want the Christians to remember something. <clears throat> For Isaiah or Moses to prophesy the coming of a prophet that contradicts their theology makes no sense. Now, why do I say this? I won't take too much time to unpack this. Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, folks, just let me give you two examples. You cannot have a prophet prophesying Muhammad who ends up contradicting, contradicting the theology of the prophet. Christians pay attention to this. The greatest proof of Muhammad's fraud and that these prophets did not prophesy his coming is that Muhammad contradicts the theology of Isaiah and Moses, especially in the book of Deuteronomy. And I'll give you an example, two examples from Isaiah. In Isaiah 9, verse 6, we are, we are told, guys, listen to this argument, because this hits at the heart of chapter 112, verse 3 of the Quran. In chapter 112, verse 3, it says, Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He neither begets nor is begotten. All right, folks, 
Isaiah 9, verse 6. You have people who can read the Hebrews who are going to confirm what I'm about to say. There it says, for unto us a child is born. Hebrew, yelid yulad, child born, yelid yulad. The Hebrew cognate of the words used in chapter 1, 12, verse 3 of the Quran. A child born, and for unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. He shall be called the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, El Gibor, the very title given to Yahweh, Jehovah, in Isaiah 10, 21. A child born who is the Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And in verse 7 it says, He will sit on the throne of David. This is why even rabbinic Jews have interpreted this as a prophecy of Messiah. Folks, notice what you just learned here. A child is born who's the mighty God. That means the mighty God will be born as a baby, as a child, to sit on David's throne forever and ever. So this child is the God baby, the God child, the God man. How then can Isaiah prophesy Muhammad, who denies that his God can be born as a baby, born as a man, take on human nature? This is a contradiction. How could Isaiah mention a prophet who would cut at the very theology of Isaiah? And the second example is Isaiah 53, Hang on, Sam. the servant. One Go second. Ahead. I wanted to actually put those up on the screen so people don't think that we're making anything up. And uh, all right. So here we have here we have Isaiah chapter 9. So keep in mind, <laughs> and really we're bringing these up because... Uh, one, we had a request for it, but now Nadim, keep in mind, Nadim, who defended Deuteronomy 33 as a prophecy about Muhammad, and who then defended um, John 14 and 16 as prophecies about Muhammad, even though both passages would call Muhammad God, if if he's right. Uh, now he's defending the claim that this is, uh, that Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, chapter 42, is talking about Muhammad. And Sam's point, Nadim, we know we have to slow things down for you. Yeah. Sam's point here is if you're saying that Isaiah was prophesying about Muhammad, then you'd better pay attention. You'd better pay attention if the theology of the book of Isaiah completely contradicts Islam. Just like if one of your apologists is telling you that Muhammad is mentioned in the Gospel of John, well, if you've got a book that starts off by calling Jesus God and saying that the word became flesh, God became flesh and dwelt among us and talks about his crucifixion, his crucifixion, his sacrifice for sins. If you're, if you're going to a book that completely contradicts your theology, you might want to take that unless you're from a religion that does not care about truth or reality 100%. at all, in which case you're telling us something about your religion. Now, what Sam is pointing out here is you've got the book of Isaiah which completely, utterly, totally contradicts the theology of Islam. This is where you're telling us. So what you're telling us is Isaiah prophesied a prophet who was going to completely contradict the teachings of Isaiah. That's what you're telling us, right? You're telling us that Isaiah, yeah, he's talking about a prophet who's going to come and who's going to completely refute the teachings of Isaiah. Well, if Muhammad completely refuted the teachings of Isaiah, why would we take Isaiah's prophecy seriously? He completely contradicts Muhammad. Why should you take him as a prophet? Now what Sam quoted here, it says, from the book of Isaiah, which you're going to, which you're going to, to confirm Muhammad. Why are you going here? Because you read the book? No, you never read the book. If you have, you're a liar, right? Sorry. If you have, then you're a liar and a deceiver. Right now, I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt and assuming that you are actually simply ignorant, right? We can forgive. We can forgive ignorance, although if you're ignorant, we have no idea why you keep posting comments instead of, you know, listening and learning and, and actually doing some reading, right? So... It's your apologists who actually read the book. They completely distort the meaning. They know that it completely refutes their religion, but they're liars. They're liars. They're liars who deceive gullible people who never call them out, right? That's why, that's why you can have the top Muslim channel in the world call Muhammad Yahweh, the God of the Bible, over and over again. That's why you can have your top apologists say that Muhammad is Yahweh, that Muhammad is the Holy Spirit, and you guys never call them out because you don't care. As long as you're praising exactly. and glorifying Muhammad, you just don't care if you're calling him God. That's how sick your religion is. Right? But look at this passage here. This is in the book of Isaiah. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name, whose name? This child, this son. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. 
on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And according to Muslims, Lord of hosts is actually Muhammad there. So I'm sure you guys yeah. will probably want to uh, insist that this is actually, uh, that Muhammad is the God of this passage. But notice, notice, child is born, son is given. He's the mighty God and he's going to reign over the throne of David. That's the Messiah. Wait a minute. According to the Quran, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the one who, re who reigns on David's throne. That's the Messiah. The Messiah is the mighty God who is born into this world as a child. You've got, the de you've got the deity of Christ. You've got the incarnation. You've got the Messiahship of Jesus all in the book of Isaiah. But this is the book, Sam. This is the book that's going to yes, prophesy right. Muhammad, who's going to come along and this. completely contradict everything that's been said here. Now, give me, let, I'm going to give them one example from Deuteronomy. This one is a nightmare for the Muslims. Remember, they're the ones who are saying Deuteronomy 33 is about Muhammad, blasphem, blasphemously attributing a passage about the wait, true wait, God, wait, wait, Muhammad. Wait, wait, wait. Hang on, Sam. Didn't you want to go to Isaiah 53? Oh, okay. I thought you mentioned that because you mentioned about the earlier, I guess you passed through it. All right, Isaiah 53, the other point. I'm going to put I'm gonna it up on the screen one here. From Deuteronomy. Okay. I'm going to mention one from Deuteronomy, but Isaiah 53. Guys, understand the point. The reason why we're repeating this point it's for the Christians to get it, understand it, make it second nature, and keep ramming it down the throats of Muslims until they either give up using the Bible or give up on Muhammad and following Jesus. The other problem with saying that Muhammad is a prophet that Isaiah announced would come in the future is that in Isaiah 53, the servant of the Lord will bear the sins of the world, of the nations, and of Isaiah's people— he will offer his life, and in Isaiah 53, 10, it says, as an asham. And asham is the Hebrew word for a guilt offering. Now, even the rabbis interpret this as a reference to the Messiah. There were some rabbis that said it's about the nation of Israel or the righteous remnant. And as far as the New Testament is concerned, it's clearly Jesus. But it really doesn't matter whether you want to say it's Messiah or the righteous remnant of Israel. Do you know why? Because from a Muslim perspective, if you want to say, and Nadim, I hope he's listening, even if you're a Muslim and you want to say this is about the righteous remnant of Israel, that the righteous of Israel will suffer to atone for the sins of the wicked, even among their own countrymen. Well, according to the Quran, you don't get more righteous than Jesus, who's an Israelite, who's absolutely sinless. So even that view must include Jesus. Let me repeat. According to chapter 19, verse 19 of the Quran, Jesus is Ghulamin Zakiyan, pure, faultless, righteous, holy son. So even you Muslims, if you want to say Isaiah 53 is about the righteous remnant, not necessarily Messiah, you're still stuck because Jesus is an Israelite. And who is more qualified of being part of that righteous remnant than Jesus? So you're still stuck with Jesus being part of the fulfillment of Isaiah 53. But wait, Muslims, from, last, from what I <clears throat> checked last time, according to the Quran and the Hadith, Jesus didn't die to atone for the sins of anyone. But Isaiah 53 clearly says this servant is bearing the punishment for the sins of Isaiah's people and the nations to make atonement and reconcile them to God. And God will then glorify that servant. So whether you want to say it's the Messiah or the righteous remnant, either interpretation still includes Jesus. <clears throat> either interpretation still contradicts the Quran because the Quran denies that Jesus died for anyone's sins. Now, I shouldn't say deny it. It doesn't mention it. It doesn't even address it. So now you can't have your cake and eat it too. If Isaiah prophesied <clears throat> Muhammad, then either you're going to say the Quran has been changed and corrupted because Muhammad would not have taught a theology that contradicts Isaiah, or you're going to have to admit the Quran doesn't deny that Jesus did die for the sins of others, because even that one passage that refers to the crucifixion is making another point. You can't have your cake and eat it too. So now, David, you want to elaborate? Go ahead, and then we'll go to Deuteronomy. I'll probably just read this passage. And guys, I just want to say, uh, you can read this passage to a Muslim and ask the Muslim who it's talking about, and they'll say, oh, yeah, it's talking about Jesus, but we, you know, we don't believe that passage. <laughs> That's how clear it is. Guys, this was written seven centuries. This is written seven centuries before the time of Jesus. Ready? Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant 
and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. Now, guys, th- when as we're reading this passage, think about Jesus covered in blood and wounds, being led out to be nailed to a cross. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So the Lord, Muslims believe that's uh, that's Muhammad apparently, but uh, biblically no. The Lord laid on this person the iniquity of us all. Let's keep going. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that, it, that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, why is someone's soul making an offering for guilt? When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Now, why are we pointing this out, ladies and gentlemen? Again, Muslims are saying that the book of Isaiah, now we'd have to wonder why they're going to the book of Isaiah to confirm Muhammad, right? I mean, the the Quran refers to the Torah and the gospel, but you have Muslims going to the book of Isaiah. Why? Because the prophecies that they go to in the the Torah and the gospel don't tend to work out very well. And uh, here's the actual Here's the actual pattern I've seen over the years, Sam. Maybe you can confirm this, right? Yep. Muslims will point to a, a, a passage in the Bible and say, you see, that's about Muhammad. And then they'll run around saying that this passage is about Muhammad. And they'll catch a bunch of people off guard because a lot of people aren't familiar with the passage. And they'll be able to spread the false claim that that's actually about Muhammad. And they'll be able to deceive lots of people. But eventually, Christians will start exposing it and start showing. Uh, actually, if you read, if you, actually if you read the context, it's, it's saying the opposite of what you said. It actually says Muhammad can't be a true prophet, right? And so they'll get nabbed like that, right? So what do they do? They'll come up with a new prophecy, right? Until we start exposing that one, and then a couple of years later, they'll come out with a different one, and they'll start running around using that one, right? And so now the it's very popular to go to the Book of Isaiah to show that Muhammad is prophesied by the book of Isaiah. And the book of Isaiah, of course, is a book where God is going to become incarnate as the Messiah, and someone is going to suffer and die and be pierced for the sins of others. The theology here completely contradicts what we're told Islam teaches, and Muslims say, this is the book we're going to to confirm our our theology. Now, Now, ladies and gentlemen, notice, we're talking about the Old Testament here. You can't say you can't say Christians wrote that, right? Notice the theology of the book of Isaiah is the same as the theology of the book of John. Both of those theologies con- confirm each other, but they completely contradict Islam. What do Muslims tell us? Nope, the Gospel of John, the book of Isaiah, they're both talking about Muhammad. Yep. And we yep, can show exactly. you and we can show you by calling Muhammad God. Convert to our religion. Yeah. This is so yeah. stupid. It's so so stupid, ladies and gentlemen. And I want to make sure you got the point. You guys got the point, right? Anytime they quote a prophet to say that he announced the coming of Muhammad, just show them the theology of that prophet. Say, wait, Isaiah believes that God is a father to his people spiritually because he's a spiritual being. He doesn't sire children sexually. That's Isaiah 63, 16, Isaiah 64, verse 8. 
Isaiah believes a child will be born who's the mighty God, Yalad Yulad, the mighty God being born as a baby, a human child to become the God man, to sit on David's throne. Isaiah believes this righteous, sinless, guiltless servant will die for the sins of the world and atone for them to reconcile them to God and be exalted to reign with God. And Isaiah predicted Muhammad that you say denies all of that. That's what you do. We're trying to teach you how to take the very book, the very prophet, the very context of a particular text, turn it against Muhammad to expose that he is a fraud, an agent of the devil, and Islam is false, and Jesus is risen, he is Lord, he's alive. Final example, David, from Deuteronomy, because this one is going to shock Christians who haven't heard this before. Now, because you get the regulars here, and glory to God, we're about up to 1,500. They already know this, but there may be some new faces that are going to be shocked. Remember, folks, Adnan and the Muslims were quoting Deuteronomy 18 and Deuteronomy 33 as prophecies of Muhammad. Remember the principle. You can't have a prophet prophesying the advent of a future prophet who contradicts the theology of that prophet. Can't do it, won't be done unless you believe that God is schizophrenic or has amnesia, God forbid such blasphemy. How can Moses, how can Deuteronomy be speaking of Muhammad when Muhammad contradicts the theology of Moses? And I'll just give you two examples re real quickly. Write down Deuteronomy 14 verse 1, Deuteronomy 14 verse 1, Deuteronomy 32 verse 6, Deuteronomy 32 verse 6, and verses 18 to 20. Deuteronomy 14 verse 1, Deuteronomy 32 verse 6, Deuteronomy 13 verses 18 to 20. There Moses says, Yahweh, Yahovah, Jehovah is the spiritual father of the Israelites. The Israelites are said to be the sons of Yahovah, Yahweh, Jehovah. Jehovah says in Deuteronomy 32, 6, that he begot them. He fathered them, begot them spiritually, not physically, not sexually. He doesn't have sex. And that's reiterated in 18 to 20. The Quran in chapter 5, verse 18 says, neither the Jews nor the Christians are the sons of Muhammad's God, Allah. Then how can Muhammad be a prophet like Moses? And then the most damaging example. Folks, pay attention to this. Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 to 4. Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 to 4, God says, when a man finds something displeasing in his wife, Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 to 4, and hands her a certificate of divorce and sends her on her way, if that woman marries someone else and that man dies or divorces her, she cannot go back to her first husband because that would be an abomination to Yehovah, Jehovah the Lord Yahweh, and it would defile the land. So notice what God said. Don't you ever take back a wife that you've divorced who's remarried and her second husband either died or, or divorced her because that's something disgusting in my sight and it will defile the land. Guess what Muhammad taught? Chapter 2 of the Quran, verse 230. Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 230. Muhammad said that if a man irrevocably <clears throat> divorces his wife, meaning it's a final divorce. The Quran says he cannot take her back until she marries another one, another man, and that man divorces her. Only then will she be lawful for the first husband to take back, and then he can marry her again. Understand, folks, what this means. The God of Muhammad says this is lawful. The very thing that the God of Moses says is an abomination. It's detestable. It's abhorrent to the true God. But then the Hadiths make it worse. The Hadiths make it worse. The Hadiths say, not only must the woman that was divorced marry another man, he must taste her sweetness. He must actually have intercourse and penetrate her. Otherwise, she can never go back to her husband. So Muhammad said, your husband that you're married to, he has to sleep with you, have intercourse with you, taste your sweetness, then divorce you, and only then can you return to your husband. So that man who sleeps with her and divorces her so she can go back to her husband, he's called Muhallal, the one who makes that woman lawful for her first husband. And you're telling me Muhammad is a prophet like Moses, whom Moses announced the coming of? Seriously? Come on, guys. Gig is up. Check out this, uh, check out this comment, Sam. <clears throat> John Vance says, It's amazing that Christians think Muslims are anti-Jesus. It just shows their ignorance. So, so because we think that Islam is actually anti-Jesus, it just shows how ignorant we are. Guys, uh, Muslims, Muslims, I want you to share in the chat 
According to Islam, what did Jesus actually get done that lasted? Yeah. What did Jesus accomplish that actually lasted? What did he do that lasted? You could say, oh, he preached. Yeah, but that didn't last. It was corrupted by Allah, right? Allah came yeah. in and tricked everyone into believing that Jesus died on the cross, and Allah actually accidentally started Christianity. So, oopsie. So Jesus' message was corrupted. What did Jesus actually get done in Islam? Ladies and gentlemen, just think about this, right? According to Jesus and his followers, Jesus is the divine son who enters creation, takes on flesh to die for the sins of humanity. Muslims say, no, he's just a prophet who talked about Muhammad coming, but his message was all corrupted and uh, everything he did was just destroyed by God and the Apostle Paul. And they say, you see, we're pro-Jesus. You're not pro-Jesus by insulting and blaspheming everything he did. Yep. You're, you are not honoring the Lord of creation by saying he's just a prophet of Islam. That Again, that is the most revolting thing you can say about anyone. Saying that you're a prophet who, who, who taught the same thing that Muhammad taught is the biggest, I can't imagine a bigger insult. But Muslims, show us how you honor Jesus. Tell us something that Jesus actually got done that lasted in Islam. Because every time you talk about Jesus, you talk about how everything was corrupted and it didn't last and everything was changed and he couldn't get the job done. And that's why God had to send Muhammad to actually get the job done. And you think you're honoring Jesus. Go ahead, tell us. Yep, 100%. And as you're waiting for a response, look mm -hmm. what this Muslim says. I think he's left Islam from his comments. He's been coming to our channels, but look what he says. Abdullah Aman, mm -hmm. Allah can't be Yahweh. Prophet Muhammad never worshiped Yahweh and never recited his name as Yahweh. Some Muslims should stop using Bible. Bam! Abdullah Aman, may the Lord Jesus bring you to his love and to his feet and flood you in his love forever in Jesus' name. They're um, getting it, David. A lot of Muslims are getting it. Glory to God. Wait, do you know he's actually an ex-Muslim? How do you know he's just not, uh, not named Abdullah or something? Well, because he's come to my channel before saying that he was a Muslim, oh, okay. but he was struggling with his faith at that time. The way it sounds, it sounds like he's left Islam, but he did say Prophet Muhammad. So he's on a journey. That's how I know. All right, here, uh, here we have a, a Muslim, uh, Truth and Courage, says, How can Jesus be the Father and the Son at the same time? Um, I guess he's referring to uh, the passage in Isaiah. Uh, Truth and Courage, yeah. uh, uh, guess what? I'm a father and a son. Yep. I'm a father and a son in different ways. With, res with respect exactly. to different kinds of relationships, I am both a father and a son, right? Yeah. Jesus, in terms of being... The tr being a person of the triune God who created everything is the father of all creation, right? Father, right. Son, and Holy Spirit together are father over exactly. all creation. So in that sense, he is he is father. Um, his relationship within the Trinity is he is the he is the son He's of the, the son. father, right? So that's yeah. how that's how. And, yeah. and and by the way, guys, creation is actually is actually connected. We're created by the triune God, right? And that's so right. we're created by the triune God. And so we have we're created in the image of God, and we have we have relationships where we would be both father and son in different ways, and so on. So you find the same thing within uh, within the one God. Um, all right, Sam, we have a few minutes left. Should we sure. should we take the Whatever super chats? Or did, did Muslims yeah, yeah. did Muslims ahead. ever respond and tell us anything no. that Jesus got done? No, no, that gentleman that you quoted, John Vance, went on some other tangent that ignored everything you said. So no, nothing, but glory to God. Guys, please, let me encourage you again. Re-listen to these sessions. Learn the materials uh, to become second nature, and please use these arguments. And I'm going to repeat it again. By the power of the Holy Spirit, these are arguments that have been battle-tested and refined in spiritual battle. Not physical battle. We're not jihadis. Our battle is spiritual with the weapons of the Holy Spirit that are indestructible. I guarantee you, you learn these arguments, you will destroy Islam for the glory of Jesus, and Muslims will leave in droves, and hopefully by the power of the Holy Spirit, fall in love with Jesus. Please use our materials for the glory of Christ. A uh, little side note here before we, uh, we'll check out some super chats, and then we'll uh, cut out here. But uh, Riddle Factory, Sam. Riddle Factory. <laughs> Riddle Ooh. Factory says, I am reading Quran since decades and have not found even a single error. We should do a session on that, right? Uh, that's why I'm putting it up here. I've not found a single error. The problem is if you trust in anti-Islamic sites, then they will only deceive. Well, Sam, I have a little, uh, I can actually keep this comment. And what we could do is actually start Amen. off a program where we, we will uh, go ahead and bring up what, 
what we regard as errors in the Quran. You know, like the sun setting in a muddy pool yes. and stars or missiles goodies. that Allah uses to shoot demons and saying Jesus wasn't crucified. All these things that are obvious blunders. We can go through them and we'll give Riddle Factory an opportunity to perform the miracle of reinterpretation. Um, and the thing about the, the miracle of reinterpretation, Riddle Factory, is you can do it. You can do it once, you can do it twice, you can do it three times. After you do it 40 or 50 times, people start catching on that you're taking perfectly clear verses and distorting the meaning because if you go with the plain meaning, they're clearly and indisputably wrong. So we can actually do that, Sam. We can do, uh, yes, we we can, do. Uh, we maybe can do next a show. Saturday, with God willing. If you have no other new topics or challenges, maybe next Saturday. Maybe maybe this week. Who knows? All right. Who knows? Know. All right. Let's I take a field there with that one. Shit. Let's do it. <laughs> let's take a, let's take a, let's see. Let's go through some super chats here. All right. And then we will see why Muhammad, blah, 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 blah. All right. Uh, Nicola Sedutu said, uh, read your email, Sam. God bless you and your families. I'm guessing Nicola sent you a, an email. Um, okay. Rory Husky said, David would look at Quran, yeah, and you, are, you already touched on this earlier, Sam. Look at Quran 1591 and then go back up to Quran 159. Don't they contradict right. each other? Uh, I told this uh, to Rob Christian and Reason Answers. You should check them out. Yeah, um, I've already I've already done the yeah, 15.9, just for the record, says, we have sent down dhikr. Mm -hmm. We have sent down the dhikr, and we will guard it. Now, mm -hmm. the question is, the word dhikr, which Yusuf Ali says message, but it's more accurately translated reminder or remembrance. When Allah says he sent down the dhikr, the reminder, remembrance, is he talking about the Quran alone, or is he talking about all the revelation? And I made a case, and I've debated it online via written means, that if you actually take that word, dhikr, reminder, remembrance, and see how it's used elsewhere in the Quran, it doesn't refer just to the Quran. I'm not denying that it refers to the Quran, but it also refers to all the scriptures given to all the messengers before Muhammad, chapter 16, verse 43, chapter 21, verse 7, just two for the sake of brevity, says that if you doubt that Allah sent men as messengers, ask Ahl al dhikr Ask the people of the remembrance. And if you go to Tafsir Jalalain, David, and you know mm -hmm. this, he says that the people of the remembrance are those who read the Torah and the Gospels. Mm -hmm. So now, David, help me understand this. If chapter 59, verse 9 says, 59, we sent down the dhikr, it doesn't qualify. Uh -huh. It doesn't say we sent down this dhikr or we sent down the dhikr to you. We sent down the dhikr, a general statement, all of it. Whatever is the dhikr, we send it out and we will guard it. Wouldn't that also include the Bible if it's also the dhikr? Yep, and if uh, if our Muslim friends want to say, nope, the, the Bible's been corrupted, then then Surah 15.9 is not saying that no one can corrupt the reminder, right? If you're saying, so if the if the, the Torah, the Gospel, and the Quran are all the reminder, and Allah says that he's sent the reminder and he's going to guard it, and you say the Torah and the Gospel have been corrupted, then Allah guarding the reminder does not mean it can't be corrupted, and you can't use Surah 15, verse 9 to say that your Quran's been perfectly preserved. You can't exactly. use it. You can't use it anyway because it doesn't make any sense to say. But the Quran says it's been perfectly preserved, even though later in the same in the same chapter, verse 1591, it says the Quran's been shredded. And even though we know from history, Muslim sources saying that entire chapters came up missing, large passages came up missing, verses were eaten by a sheep. They're no longer in the Quran. Um, yeah. So, guys. Notice what notice what kind of apologist you're you're dealing with. The Quran could not possibly have been corrupted. Allah says He's going to protect it. No, He says He's going to protect the reminder, which includes all the scriptures. But you say you, you call it, so you're calling him a liar. There, you're, you're the one exactly. saying you're the one saying that His scriptures have been corrupted. Great. If He couldn't protect the Torah, even though He bragged about it, bragged about being able to that no one can change His words, and but He couldn't protect the Torah and He couldn't protect the gospel, and He couldn't protect then great. He can't protect the Quran. Your God is useless. All right, ready? Yep. Go ahead. Uh, Cindy Lou says Muslims make claims based on certain ayat, then deny the tafsirs and their exegesis from their own scholars. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> She's right. If, not much to say. Yeah, if Muhammad <laughs> walked the earth, the Muslims would be embarrassed by him. That, that's absolutely correct. Yes, Cindy Lou. Hundred <laughs> percent. Notice Muslim Muslims will quote a, will quote a Quran verse when it's convenient and it actually fits what they believe. Other than that, they'll throw it out. If you go to the commentaries. 
and it contradicts their, their understanding, they will throw them out. But these same Muslims will go to commentaries if it fits their purpose. They go to the Bible and they do the exact same thing. Oh, this verse, I can distort that into confirming Islam, so that one's good. Oh, that verse over there, nope, that it doesn't fit with Islam, that's been corrupted. It is the worst methodology a person can possibly have. Ladies and gentlemen, you could, you could use this exact same methodology that Muslims use to support any position ever, right? If your method is to simply go through some book and pull out things that that are, are useful to you and that you can twist and distort into confirming you and that you'll throw everything out, you can use that methodology with anything to defend right. any position, right? I could go to Dr. Seuss and say, Dr. Seuss proves that I'm a prophet and use that methodology. <laughs> Uh, I could man. use that methodology, right? Well, he did prophesy me. Sam, I am, eats green eggs. You see ham, that? So it's proof. We need to do that. We need to do that Sam, and show I that am, all of, we need to ham. show that all of green eggs and ham is actually a prophecy about you. That's right. Right here. <clears throat> um, <laughs> Peter Millick said, David, I'd be surprised if you haven't brought up your favorite Quran verse, Surah 33, verse 53. Quit showing up to his house early and don't stay late. Yeah, guys, I have a, I have a, a video called My Favorite Quran Verse or My Favorite Verse of the Quran or something like that. It's uh, one of my favorite videos I've ever made, but yeah, check that out. Uh, Luke 007 said, if Muhammad was not a prophet, how did he know where the sun sets? <laughs> he got you there, David. Surprise, David. <laughs> Surprise. How did, Muhammad, how did Muhammad know where the sun sets? All right, guys, we're going to take one or two more Uh Questions from the Super Chat. I know there are more, but I actually have to get off here. Uh, not only is it Mother's Day, it's my youngest son's birthday, and actually the family is down there. I, told, I forgot I forgot, I forgot. forgot they're having a birthday party down here when I when I set up the live stream. Um, so I have to I have to get off here because uh, the, the... And don't remind them, David, two <coughs> hours after this, I'm going to go live. God willing, two hours after he's done, I'm going to go live on Hebrews 1, proving Jesus is God Almighty, Lord Jesus willing. So join me. Go ahead, David. Knock yeah. it out of the park, baby. Yeah, and the the link to Sam's channel, Sam's channel is in the description box, so be sure to subscribe because uh, when, when Sam and I aren't going live, he's going live on his own channel, and he goes in-depth on a lot of issues. Smidley says, I rejoice both of you are leading Muslims to the Lord Jesus Christ. Right, after, uh, after I go uh, hang out with the family for a little bit, I'm actually going to post a video on a bunch of, uh, bunch of comments from Muslims who are leaving Islam. And Ricard Hisperanium Rex says, thank you for your work again, guys. God bless you and your loved ones. All right, there's just two. Uh, I'm sorry, guys. There's, there's too many comments to go through. But uh, so, yeah, we've been a little behind. Norm normally, we just keep rolling as long as we want. But today and yesterday, I actually have to have to get off relatively on time. All right. Any final words, Sam? Let me let me bless you with Muhammad Ibn Jars. He's on his way to becoming a Christian. Pray for him. Muhammad Ibn Jars. David. This mm -hmm. is the Lord Jesus confirming that we're being used for his glory, and may we keep being used until we die and meet Jesus. He says, Acts 17, Apologetic Shemunian. I learned much from you both. Many questions I have, you answer without me asking. Many questions mm -hmm. I have, you answer without me asking. Glory to Jesus. May he bring you to his feet and fill you with his love in Jesus' name. That's what it's all about. May we die glorifying Christ. Because mm -hmm. it's all about and, him. Uh, Thanks, everyone, for the birthday wishes. That's my youngest son, Kepler. He turned two today. Hallelujah. God bless your family, a beautiful, godly wife, and five young lions. Glory to Jesus. May he bless them and preserve them and preserve you for many years to destroy Islam for the glory of Jesus. All right. We will catch you all next time. And again, uh, Sam will be live in a little while, and I'll be posting a video as well. So stay tuned.